Merry Christmas and Happy Boxing Day. I'm Arianna Kelland, and tonight we celebrate this Christmas season by going back to the past. Our first story is from Francois, a tiny outport on the south coast of Newfoundland. Larry Hudson takes in the festivities during a visit to the community in 1981. And what's a Christmas party without mummers? Francois is a tiny outport nestled under massive cliffs on the southwest coast of Newfoundland. It's a picture postcard setting that has changed little since the days of the early settlers 300 years ago. This is a place full of love for life, for each other and for all living things. For the men and women of Francois who toil hard all year long, there is something very special about Christmas. It's the highlight of the year. For 12 days, the people here celebrate, and it's some celebration. The mummers kick it off, laughing, singing, and joking. They make their rounds house to house around the harbor. There's a card party going on at Gladys Marsden, a game of 120, men against the women. Christmas cheer is flowing. We'll never know who won. Cards were forgotten as the mummers, already glowing from the Christmas spirit, arrive at the door. Yes, come in. Making their own fun is a way of life here. Everyone has something to contribute. The place of course is France, way have led each by the sea. Our harbor is a haven for ships of every sort. They come to seek their refuge from windy stories and storms. Even the children get into the act. They coax their parents to the community hall to put on their own concert. Now that the drinks have been all passed around, the mummers are plugging their day. We're going to have a great joke in a time. And if you will join us, I'm sure you will see that our mood join is better than the last you know, this our life, and uh, I guess we'll try to continue to keep it that way. You know, we know the difference. We know what it's like uh, living in a big place. Not because we're in a small place that we don't know what it's like out in the world. Oh, no. I mean, First, I'm concerned, people in France was what you call real knockabouts. I mean, they've been around, you know. When they're gone, it's like they lose for a time to come back, like, you know. This is Larry Hudson, reporting from Francois. Sticking with the south coast of the island, we take a trip to Ramia. In 1987, our reporter Marie Thompson went to the island where there's a very unique tradition of tree cutting. You have to take a boat to get to Ramia, a rocky, windswept but thriving community 15 kilometers off Newfoundland's rugged south coast. Getting ready for Christmas is much like anywhere else. On the weekend, the children's choir practices Christmas carols. In the evenings, folks get together for a few good times and jigs with local musicians. 
And as the time gets closer to Christmas, families start thinking about something else that's familiar to all of us, picking out a Christmas tree. But that's a bit trickier here than it is in other parts of Canada. Because there are no trees. So setting out to find a tree becomes a bit of an expedition. Aubrey Keeping gets his on a nearby island, 10 minutes away. But the pickings are pretty slim there. This is his third trip back from the island. His family didn't like the first two trees. He's better than the one I got anyway after now. But fishermen who own bigger boats are able to travel farther in search of the perfect tree. Not far from Ramia, on the mainland of Newfoundland, is one of the south coast's most spectacular sites, White Bear Bay. Roy Giles takes some of his kids along with him. Up ahead is his friend Rob Pink in the Norma Lee with some of his family. And as they sail in the shadow of the 50 meter high walls of the fjord, it's obvious there'll be no trouble finding trees here. Once in the woods, young Stacy attacks his tree. His dad, Rob Pink, isn't sure he likes it. Not enough uh, limbs on top. But they decide to keep it anyway and haul it back to the beach. And what about this one? Oh, saved anyway. Might be all right. The trees are ferried to the longliners in small skiffs. Well, we got two fine ones, eh? Clyde Pink says people actually start thinking about Christmas early on in the year. In the fall of the year, they're in around there, like, and probably, well, like, rambling around, and they come across, see a tree, what they think is suitable, and they just uh, watch it, you know, and leave it there until around Christmas time, they come in and cut it down. Then it's back down the bay to open sea and the return to Ramia. Back at the wharf, they look over their spoils. This one here is going to be our tree. In Roy Giles' home, his 10-year-old daughter Krista and her friend Lee think their tree's great. It's just right for their special decorations. And it's safe to say that a dozen other families on Ramia are feeling the same way about their trees, as much a part of life by the sea as fishing is. Marie Thompson, CBC News, Ramia, Newfoundland. Young meets old in this archival piece from 1994. A group of teenagers from Fogo Island discovered for themselves what Christmas spirit was all about when they visited a senior's home in Gander and they entertained the residents. CBC reporter Carmel Smith was there too. The music was on key, the singing was not. But that didn't bother these students from Fogo Island. And it sure didn't bother their audience. Seniors at Gander's Lakeside Homes were delighted. Please God, we will see you next year. <laughs> they clapped and sang along. and danced if they could find a partner. That was nice. You like the dancing, didn't you? You yeah. like the dancing? Yeah, lovely. Yeah. Sing we joy us all together. Students spent about an hour singing and chatting. There was no question the visit was a success from the residents' point of view. They're happy that the young people would think enough about them to come in. It goes. But students say they're the ones who really gained. I surprised myself, like, when I came in here, like, I wasn't too interested in this type of thing, but I came in, I saw everybody, and I got right in the middle of it. The uh, old people were just the same as us. Awesome. It was very lonely for these people to be alone at Christmas and stuff like that, and they haven't got very many people to talk to, so it was just nice to come in and spend some time with them. That's what teacher Rick Duffy wanted his students to realize, that holidays aren't happy for everyone. Go out of your way to say Merry Christmas to somebody, and it makes a big difference to them. Duffy says his students also learned another important lesson. Instead of doing, saying somebody should do it, we take matters in their own hands and we do it. The students will take their lessons home along with their memories. When the lady cried when we gave her the card and the man, when he got up to dance, he was so happy, you know, that he didn't get to dance in such a while, I guess, and he just cried and he really stick in your mind for a long time. Most seniors' homes in the province welcome visitors this time of year. Carmel Smith, CBC News, Gander.
Welcome back to A Christmas Past. Well, right about now, people are hearing the knock on their door that signals the mummers are here. It's a decades old tradition and one that lives on today. Our Chris O'Neill Yates has that story from 2011. A festive sight on a midwinter's night. A group of masked merrymakers out for some holiday hijinks. <laughs> a traveling band of mischief and merriment. Sherry McCann remembers the excitement of mummering as a child in Outport, Newfoundland. Twelve nights of the year. We couldn't wait to get out our mummering stuff. And she still enjoys it just as much today. Really, it's just the sense of fun. And Newfoundlanders are famous for that already. Half the fun is the guessing game of who's underneath the disguise. Now, some mummers will do just about anything to keep their identity veiled. You can tell someone who boozes by the company she chooses. And the pig got up and slowly walked away. <laughs> Mummering here goes back three centuries. It's undergone other revivals. In the mid-1980s, the catchy tune, The Mummer's Song, resuscitated the seasonal shenanigans. Granny, tis mummers, there's 20 or more. There's a string that's attached here. Ryan Davis has been active in the latest revival. And I think there's something exciting about visiting your friends and being a fool or being playing the gatch or being some character that you're not normally. With each revival, this guy becomes even more popular. An annual Mummers Parade now brings hundreds of people out into the streets of St. John's. Even though Newfoundland is still a pretty safe place, no one's going to open their doors to people in masks. So these days, Mummers just call ahead. When Mummering was being revived, in fact, that's how it was revived. People would be having a, a big party and they'd be saying, oh, it'd be so nice to have some Mummers drop in. Mummering does exist in other forms in other parts of the world, but not like this. With all this excitement going on, who could resist joining in the fun? It's our own unique style, it's a part of who we are, and uh, absolutely amazes uh, people uh, when they come here and discover uh, the kind of antics we get up to uh, during the Christmas season. It's a tradition that's been around for hundreds of years, and by the looks and sounds of this, it could be around for hundreds more. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Kitty Bitty Village. CBC's Land and Sea program called A Fortune Bay Christmas is a popular show for many this time of year. It features music, songs, and mummers, and of course, Granny. In 1996, Deborah Collins headed out to English Harbor West to meet the real Mummer's granny, 91-year-old Janet Baker. Don't seem like Christmas if the Mummers are not here. Granny would say as she'd knit in her chair. Things have gone modern, and I suppose that's the cause. Christmas is not like it was. Mark, what's the noise out by the porch door? Granny, tis mummers, there's twenty or more. Her old withered face brightens up with a grin. Any mummers, nice mummers, loud in. It's become as much a Christmas tradition as mummering itself. A Fortune Bay Christmas, Land and Sea's Christmas show, aired 11 years ago and every year since. It featured a South Coast duo called Simini, a few mummering minstrels, and the nostalgic Nan who at 80 years of age came to symbolize the merriment of Christmas past. My blizzard will die with the heat. There's only one there that I think that I know. It's a familiar face, the face that launched a thousand memories and etched with many more. At 91, Janet Baker is still going strong and hasn't lost her neck with a knitting needle. The first thing that I'd, I'd like to ask you is, I'm sure what everybody in Newfoundland and Labrador wants to ask you, 
and that is, how are you? Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Janet Baker is a woman of few words. For 80 years, she lived a quiet, matter-of-fact life as a wife, mother, and grandmother. But 11 years ago, a television crew descended on English Harbor West looking to immortalize the old ways. And the rest, as they say, is history. If somebody had said to you 20 years ago, you were going to be a, a TV star and everybody in Newfoundland and Labrador is going to know who you are, what would you have said to them? <laughs> I thought I was going to be as crazy, probably. <laughs> <laughs> be careful the lamp and hold on to the stove. Don't swing granny hard, cause you know that she's old. No need for to care how you buckles the floor, cause mummers have danced here before. But there she was, stepping her down with the best of them, knitting flung to one side, hanging with all her might to the past. Tell me about the first night it came on TV. Did you, did you sit and watch it? Oh, yes. <laughs> How did that feel? <laughs> Not too bad. Grandchildren, children. When did you see me on TV? They kissed the TV. <laughs> Baker herself embraced the chance to relive her own childhood on a coast famous for its mummering. Ah, oh, can we just sit around? Probably some having a drink or some a bit of cake or something. Yeah. You had to feed them before they went. Yeah. Didn't give a dance around. Yeah. But Davidge remembers too. Simonize singer-songwriter lives right across the road from Janet Baker and delivers her mail every day. Good day, ma'am. Good day. Good day. Got you a bit of mail for you. Not very much today though. No, no, no good day. mail today. No, just catalog, Christmas catalog. Eleven years ago, when the CBC crew proposed reenacting his new song about mummering, Davidge didn't have to look far for his granny. She's a special person, there's no question about that, and a genuine, real person. Uh, we go to see her pretty often and do little things for her and that sort of thing. And uh, the part, the fact that when she did the part, she wasn't acting at all. Mm -hmm. uh, she was just doing it in a natural way, and that's exactly how it came out. And we were really fortunate with that total show with the Fortune Bay Christmas because all of the characters, so so called, were real people, and they acted real people. You know, real people with more to do than live in the past. These days, Granny is still in the business of preserving her roots. But these roots have more to do with jam than jannying. You want to help? You want to help me and pick up some meat? You want to help pick up And as she quietly tends her rhubarb with the help of her granddaughter and great-great-granddaughter, on this day, her son Tom and his grandson are heading back to Ontario after a summer vacation. Playing a granny is easy compared to the real thing. And this is the hard part. Saying so long, worrying about their safety on the road, storing up memories for the long winter ahead. Setting another row of stitches for another pair of socks. Which, when you think about it, is how the whole thing got started in the first place. Good night and good Christmas, mummers, me dears. Please God, we will see you next year. Welcome back to our Christmas special, A Christmas Past. Well, for children, there's nothing more magical than meeting Santa Claus. Our next story is about a man who brought Santa to hundreds of young orphans in St. John 60 years ago. He was an American serviceman who made a huge difference in their lives. And now, two of those orphans are going to meet him again. Here and now's Robin Miller followed them to Bowling Green, Virginia in 2012. 
Welcome to Bowling Green, Virginia, a small town just outside Richmond. It's mid-November, but signs of the season are slowly starting to pop up on the streets. At this house, however, the spirit of Christmas never really goes away. Earl and Emily Chilton have been married 66 years. They do everything together, but it's what they did six decades ago in Newfoundland that brings us here now. In 1953 and 1954, the Chiltons came up with a plan that would give more than 600 orphans in St. John's a Christmas gift. It was something unbelievable, it really was. I mean, it had to touch your heart. Seeing the, the surprise and the happiness and everything on those little faces, it was just great. At the time, 26-year-old Earl Chilton was stationed at Fort Pepperell. It was the beginning of his long career in the Air Force. A young, handsome, ambitious man starting a family and making a life for himself in St. John's. In 1953, the Chiltons lost their son, a baby boy who never made it home from the hospital. That's when they began visiting children in the orphanages. We got attached to a lot of the children there, and when Christmas came, uh, they were all so poor that we wanted to do something. Proud of our school, we try to do our best and keep children room. Chilton came up with the idea to raise money for Christmas presents with a concert. A group of orphans came to the base and performed, not knowing that Chilton was handing around a collection. And we raised, I believe it was $5,400, which was a lot of money back in 53. My general, General Myers, called me and said, I hear you've raised some money. And I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm going to give you my airplane and crew and send you to New York, where you can get a lot more for your money. So off Chilton went, 10 days before Christmas, to buy 650 gifts in the Big Apple. But without the magic of Santa's sleigh, he had to call for reinforcement. They began sending stuff to me. And stuff came so fast and furious that I had to call the general back and ask him for another airplane. But I couldn't get on the airplane myself after we loaded it. The plan was gaining momentum. Next came wrapping. That's where Emily comes in. She and the other women on the base sprung into action with one thing on their minds. Will we ever get it done <laughs> in time? But we did, and oh, it was great. And then on Christmas Eve night, we went with five Santas to five orphanages, got all those little kids out of bed, and called their names, and they came up and got their presents. It was a Christmas these kids will never forget. Mount Cashel was one of those orphanages. From the outside, it looked like a well-run Catholic organization for boys. But on the inside, stories of corruption and abuse, both physical and sexual. At the time, Chilton didn't know how much Christmas gifts would mean to those kids, kids like Jimmy Joe Eason and Doug Fowler. Mount Cashel wasn't, wasn't a good place, you know, I came out later. Uh, for all the abuse and stuff, but those couple of Christmases were the best. They're the best I ever had, actually, I think probably to this day, because we had nothing, it came from nowhere. I'm not religious anymore, but I would just say, if, if, if there was a miracle in my life with those two Christmases that Earl had. It's right to say that he was my Santa Claus. Now, how excited would children be if they were going somewhere to meet their Santa Claus? I am going to meet my Santa Claus, and I'm excited as can be. It is Fowler's first time meeting the Chiltons, the family who he says gave him hope once again. When he was asked what he wanted for Christmas that year, Fowler says he didn't think he would actually get it. At that point, he had lived 12 years, much of them full of broken promises and disappointment. Then, Christmas Eve, lo and behold, in come the trucks 
and the lights and the, the Air Force personnel in their uniforms and Santa Claus. And we gathered again up in the recreation room and Santa Claus came in and the clapping and the shouting and everything. And then a hush. The list was read. James Eason, come up. Ho, 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 come up, Jimmy Eason, come up. Jim looked at me and I looked at Jim. And Jim very tentatively went up, got his package, came down, hold it tight, got into his chair. And a little while passed, Doug Fowler, ho, ho, Doug Fowler, ho, 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 Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. Jim, quack, 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 I can see it. I went on up, I got a package. In Bowling Green, Virginia, it isn't hard to find the Chilterns. This barn towers over their quaint property, a gathering place for family and the community. The doors here are always open, Earl Chilton's history built right in. Today they are preparing for company. Today they will see two of the orphans they gave gifts to almost 60 years ago. I just got a a great feeling every time I see any of them. I really do. And uh, I just wouldn't take anything for this visit. For the Chiltons, the response was overwhelming. Just to bring happiness to somebody else. It's always good. Oh, that was really something. And we just kept getting stuff for a year. So it, it's really has played a great part in our lives. The bond the Chiltons have with some of the orphans is still strong. Last summer, Earl Chilton's daughters visited St. John's. Now they are here at the Richmond Airport to greet two former Mount Cashel boys, two big fans of their father. It's Doug Fowler's first time meeting Earl and Emily Chilton, something he has wanted to do for a long time. In the hour-long car ride from Richmond to Bowling Green, the mood started out light. As you know, I smell like a hamburger, so I'm just praying he won't bite me. But as we rolled into Bowling Green, things grew a bit quieter, the anticipation growing. I'm very, very excited. It's a... Uh, it's kind of a Christmas feeling, you know, just to see Mr. Chilton. And then it was time. I'll uh, give you a hug too, pal. So good to see you. Oh, it's good to see I you. I heard so much about you. Yeah, yeah. They all tell me that you keep the party going. Well, you haven't changed a bit. Look, I, 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 I know you're on the street. <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah. It's you like you're well. coming. But I want you guys to know it's The circle. Long. The circle is now closed. You know, we, we met. Both Fowler and Eason say the visit could have not been more perfect. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this beautiful day and this beautiful reunion that we're having. And we just thank you for this whole story and how you work in such mysterious ways and wonderful ways. And in the and barn that represents everything Earl Chilton is, strong, sturdy, full of history, full of love, his children came together. I made it. I made it. And I met the man. He's the man. Robin Miller, CBC News, Bowling Green, Virginia. Welcome back. In 2002, Kevin Harvey met a family in Norris Arm who took Christmas to the extreme. They had just returned to the province from Toronto, so it was their first Christmas back home. And let's just say, they really went all out. It's Christmas night in the city. On the outside, it's nothing extraordinary, except maybe that they leave the lights on, even in the daytime. In the front we have our reindeer and our Santa Claus. But once you take a step inside, take a look at this. Every inch of space is some kind of Christmas decoration. So much so that the living room couch is in the kitchen. Fanatic. We're just like Christmas nuts. I mean that, that sums it up. I mean we think of Christmas all year round. But most of those Christmases were celebrated in Toronto, far from family. And this year, uh, you know, being home with family it makes it even better because my mom, my dad, my sister, I've never been with them at Christmas at my house. 
So they finally, for 20 years, I've had a Christmas tree, and they, my family's never seen it. In Newfoundland, is, uh, I think, is where your Christmas should be. Uh, you, got, you get all this snow, and, and, and the, you know, it's, it's more realistic. And in Ontario, we got, you're surrounded with apartment buildings and whatever, so it's, it doesn't feel like Christmas. Unless you make it in your own, and that's what we're doing. But it was more than snow that brought them back home. They decided to return last year, shortly after a drive-by shooting while the kids were playing outside in the park. Michelle felt it was no longer safe to raise a family there. The twins also like the freedom of living here, especially at Christmas. About getting gifts and spending time with my family. I feel happy, it's great, because i got lots of family around me. And Michelle Higgins says her home is open for anyone to visit. They've already had more visitors in the past couple of weeks visit their Christmas house in Norris Arm than they had visit them in 20 years in Toronto. Everything looks perfect for their first Christmas home, except for one thing. And I wish my brother can be down. My brother. Higgins' older son Jordan can't make it home for Christmas. He's working in Toronto. Higgins and family say that will be the biggest item on their wish list for next year. Kevin Harvey, CBC News, Norris Arm. Ed Roach is one of Newfoundland's best known artists. Most of his work brings the old ways of Newfoundland outports to life. In 2004, his artwork focused on the traditions of Christmas in Bain Harbor on the Buren Peninsula. Cameraman Keith Whalen followed Roach to that community. I paint Newfoundland because Newfoundland is what I know. I think growing up in Newfoundland, you uh, have an innate love of the place uh, in the same way that so many people who come here fall in love with the place. And I think because of, of the, the nature of our history and the fact that this was a desperately poor province, the paintings that normally would have been done in other areas and recording the history of a province and the way life was never got done. I like to go back and explore the roots of all that. You know, how with the backgrounds we've come from do we get to be who we are? And there are still people here today that have lived for 80, 90, 100 years. And these people have the history to tell, but we don't have the visuals to go with it and see what really happened. Bain Harbor, I think, uh, epitomizes uh, any number of com uh, communities along the coast. It's a, it's a beautiful little harbor, it's sheltered, uh, and because of the nature of the harbor, the houses literally uh, sit right at the water's edge. And then there's the social life of the community. Uh, the, the, for example, in this particular case, Christmas, so they can sort of, Santa can use that water, which is their lifeblood, and, and go over and clamp up on the wharf and go in the house and, and uh, put some joy in their life. Actually, I was in the process of uh, preparing some paintings for a calendar, uh, and I needed a December painting, and, uh, and I thought, let me go find uh, a scene in Newfoundland where I can represent Christmas as a was. And I had been down here to Bain Harbor before and I thought, what a perfect setting to, uh, to set up uh, a scene where Santa Claus is arriving uh, by boat at one of the houses in the community, as they would have way back when. Before, before Christmas, any other time, you, you weren't going around uh, playing music, you probably could play at your own house or yourself or something like that but then when you go out at Christmas time or any other special occasions or something birthdays or something like that then you take your your accordion your guitar or your milk organ or whatever you had and you just uh, dance up and have two songs and have a great time. Well when I was a kid growing up back home you expect the Santa Claus but, but in regards to what you would expect as a toy or something to play with, it was very limited, you know. Because, I mean, you may get a, a small plastic toy, you may get an apple or an orange in a, in a stocking or something like that, you know, on Christmas morning, and that would be the extent of it. My mother, when I was growing up, Mum used to make a doll and, and cut up stuff and put in the head, tie with a string around for, for the head, for the neck, and then, and then and that's what we get, I get in the stocking. 
I thought you so much about that doll. I thought you think about the day. Okay, boys. Now, what I want to do here, you go and get aboard the boat. Yeah. And then I'll get some shots of you getting on the boat yeah. and then uh, getting off again. I have to think what an incredible joy it brought to the parents in such hard times to be able to give something to their kids that made them happy. I, I would like people to look at the painting and to think that uh, what, what a, a wonderful event Christmas is for uniting families and bringing them together. Okay, go on toward the house. Uh, well, Leo, boy, thanks a lot for all your help. Oh, uh, it's been a pleasure. I think I got everything I need to, to do that painting. Oh, well, that's great. And, uh, when the card is done now, I'm going to send you out one and uh, see what you think of it. Oh, that's good. I'll be looking forward to it. Somewhere in all of us, there's a need for Santa Claus to come with something special for Christmas. Oh, yeah, sure for me in here. Oh, yeah, sure did a good job. Good boy. Yeah, says Leo, I hope this captures the Christmas you remember and reminds you of the good times. Hey, yeah, you sure did a good job, here, boy. Yes, very nice. Merry Christmas, everyone. For many years, the Rotary Club in Happy Valley Goose Bay, with the help of Air Labrador, visited communities along the south coast of Labrador. And in 1992, they asked our reporter, Tony Dawson, to travel with Santa to 10 communities. Early Saturday morning, this small plane left the North Pole. On board, Santa Claus and treats for children along Labrador's south coast. Santa doesn't have to worry if there'll be anyone to meet him. Since early this morning, snowmobiles have mobilized and gathered at five airstrips along the coast. First stop, Charlottetown. More than 200 children and parents are out on this chilly morning. Has everybody been good boys and girls? No! No! There we go. Melissa, you ready? Says this is his first Christmas. Eric, have a little smile. Well, it's lots of excitement, lots of commotion. Everybody's booting around, calling around when the plane is going to be in. So it's an exciting time, eh? What did Santa give you? Bag of chips, bears, candy, and apples. <laughs> oh, everybody is overly excited, my dear. You could tell by the crowd. It's always nice to have Santa come to town just before Christmas Eve, isn't it? Before we know it, Santa has moved a little south. Oh, it's so nice to be in poor old Simpson. <laughs> the Rotary Club in Happy Valley Goose Bay has helped Santa do this for a long time. Well, the fact that we've been able to do it every year for the last 10 years. We started in Nain and Davis Inlet 10 years ago and we've done the north and south coast of Labrador twice, every community twice, in the past 10 years. Did you see Santa? What did he say to you? What? What did he say? Ha, ha, ha. He's gotten jolly. Huh? We all expected to see reindeers as well, but I guess they were left back at the North Pole. Lavier took over. <laughs> Merry Christmas to you. Bless your heart. <laughs> Another couple of hundred kids, and it's time to move on. The Rotary Club spends several days gathering and packing the treats for the children. Uh, Rare Labrador deserves a lot of credit for, for taking the time. It's a very big expense to them, so we really appreciate it. I think the people in the community appreciate it too. Oh, coming on here, Labrador, because me, me reindeer are getting a little rest for getting ready for Christmas Eve, see? <laughs> and what are you getting for Christmas? Lots of nice things. Lots of nice oh, things. Mary Brown. Uh, some Mary Brown. <laughs> One of the Rotary members is the German Air Force commander. But for me as a German, it's a great opportunity to learn more about other interesting parts here in Labrador. <laughs> oh, I'm impressed about, uh, especially when I look into the faces of the people, they're also happy and very uh, kind to people, friendly people. It's, uh, it's good uh, to see them and how 
and what they expect when Santa Claus from, from Happy Valley is coming. Merry Christmas, everybody! See you again. One airstrip runs into another, and you've got to look quickly, or you may miss a community. It's a little mind-boggling, but Santa knows who everyone is. Gisela, and what's Santa bringing you for Christmas? You don't know. Yes, you know. No. Oh, it's going to be some nice. You're going to be some happy with it. Come on, my darling. Merry Christmas. <laughs> As everyone heads home and Santa heads back to the North Pole, there seems to be a genuine sense of satisfaction that can be summed up in just two words. Merry Christmas. Tony Dawson, CBC News with Santa on Labrador's South Coast. Christmas traditions are alive and well in this province, and no truer than in Trinity Bay. Pauline Thornhill went to Islington Hearts Delight in 1987 to follow Leander Peach singing carols passed down over generations. Leander Peach is 64 years old. He came to Hearts Delight over 40 years ago. It wasn't long before he became known for his songs. Not only can he sing, he can make up a song at the drop of a hat. One of Leander's earliest memories of Hearts Delight is his first Christmas. Some things were different then. Cutting wood was a necessity, not a pastime, and his Christmas cheer consisted of a single bottle of rum. But the main thing he remembers hasn't changed, the Islington Hearts Delight Christmas carols. The carols, preserved and passed down over generations, were sung from house to house on Christmas Eve, and they gave Leander a chance to put his voice to good use. And the first Christmas I was here, they want me to go out singing the carols with them. And I said, I didn't know what the carols was like then. So I went out with older people, like, you know, back them times then. And uh, I thought it was pretty good of them, like, you know, the way they sung it and that. So uh, I figured on to work somebody learning, like, you know, for when they die away, like, you know. So Leander memorized the carols, 12 verses altogether, all in his head. And tonight, 43 Christmases later, Leander will be leading the carolers. Traditionally, the carolers don't begin their rounds until after midnight. By then, the Christmas Eve church service is over. Many senior citizens, like Fran Tilly, have gone to bed by then, but she has one ear open for the carolers. The voices bring back memories of when she was a child. You wouldn't want to sleep through the night for anything because you, you just felt you, would, you just missed the best thing about Christmas. That was, that was really the best thing. Like many people in Hearts Delight in Islington, Fran Tilly has left her back door open to the carolers. In line with tradition, the group gathers in the porch or the kitchen to sing the two special carols, even if everyone in the house has gone to bed. The carols are usually sung in the dark, but this Christmas Eve, the group is singing by candlelight. The actual singing of the carols is serious business. Tradition has it that certain rules must be followed. Smoking and drinking are strictly off limits while the carols are being sung. Fran Tilly listens from upstairs. It isn't until after both carols are over and the lights turned on that she'll come downstairs to greet the group. Just the life of Christmas here. I mean, people are looking forward to it. I mean, they leave their doors open. No, it's what hour in the morning? What you know? I mean, you got to come as far as they're concerned. And if you don't come, and they meet their Christmas day, I mean, you're gonna you're gonna get a good a uh, good tongue banger from them, like you know. Very good. With greetings come refreshments, also a vital part of the caroling tradition. Every home the carolers visit tonight will have Christmas cake and rum. Now's the time for music of a different sort. With a little urging, Leander Peach is ready to sing a few of his own songs, with a little help from his buddy on the drums. Leander's songs are as much a part of the tradition as the carols themselves. 
Now it's just a while ago, we served the dirt clean here, you know. Some people thought we wouldn't get very far. But now we are the best, we can keep up with the rest. In Brian's country club on Cleaver Hill. This group will cover a lot of ground before daylight, and the pattern will be the same in every house they visit. It's a Christmas tradition that's become as important to the people of this area as Santa Claus, especially to people like Leander Peach. Oh, I feel I feel right, right overjoyed when Christmas comes, like, you know, because I, I love to get out with the boys and let the thing those carols, like, you know, and, and go around. I certainly do enjoy it. Like. For CBC News, I'm Pauline Thornhill. It's almost time for me to say goodbye, but first we have one more piece of Christmas past to share. Well-loved CBC reporter and host in Cornerbrook, the late Joe Mullins, often played a character called Uncle Llewellyn. As we leave you tonight, here's an excerpt of a CBC Christmas special from 1975, and Uncle Lou's version of Twas the Night Before Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone, and have a good night. Now, a bundle of toys he had flinged on his back, and he looked like a piddler. Just opening his pack. He's a piddler before he goes around piddling, see? Now, his eyes, how he twinkle, his dimples, how merry, his cheeks, he was like roses, his nose like a cherry, see? Now, his drawn little mouth was dried up in a bowl, with rabbits, and the beard on his chin was so white as the snow. See, that's what it's for. I want to come in there, eh? Now then, the stump of his pipe, he gripped that in his teeth, see? And the smoke that circled his head like a wreath, see? He had a broad face, and he had a round little belly. All of this year, he says he's after taking all these billy off, see? Now, yeah. that his belly shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. Now, he was chubby and blunt, and a right jolly old elf. And I laughed when I seen him in spite of myself, see? But he laughed at me, he was out of the way. He seen Sandy, he laughed at him, see? Now, a, a wink of his eye, you know, and a twist of his head, you know, soon gives me to know I ain't nothing to dread. Santa Claus not going to hurt you, see, is it? He comes to bring presents, don't he? See? Now, he never said a word, but he went straight to his work, what he say there, and he filled up all the stockings, see? And then he turned right quick, see? And laying his finger on the side of his nose, he went something like that, you know, like he's thinking that we've got nothing like that, you know? And he, uh, he figured he had it all done, then he dirt up the chimney again. I don't know how he gets up the chimney. Now, he springed into his sleigh, and to his team, he gives another whistle. Well, yeah, eh? You know? And away the all flew, loud the down, off a thistle. Well, I heard him saying, as he drove the uh, sight, as you heard me go he said, Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night. Good night, wave our hands, wave now. Good night, good night, all hands. Good night. Have a good Christmas, too. Hey, say your prayers before you go to bed, too. Give me a cookie, Jimmy. <laughs>